Welcome to Strip Cover Lit, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we're here for a part two of a, how many part? Five part? Six part? What Billion are doing? part. I have uh, no idea at this point. Of a six part series as we journey through uh, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. Chapter two. Chapter two. Chapter two. And Dalton, what have we got going on? <laughs> Stuff. Stuff and things are happening. Uh, James Joyce is clearly writing. That's what's happening. And uh, holy shit. So from what I've gathered, again, we are all over the place. Uh, Stephen's growing up. Uh, he's starting to question religion, sin, and uh, just general teenage angst. He's starting to have these questions. We see him actually begin to write and perform as a developing artist. He's uh, doing some theater things. He's writing for the first time, which is good. That's what I was expecting from this book. The family has moved. It appears that they've fallen on hard times. Uh, Stephen at one point wins money for an essay contest, but then completely blows all the money trying to recreate the life he once had, trying to do all these nice things, get all these things for the family. And we end uh, basically with Stephen trying to make things normal and then picking up a prostitute. That's about it. Yeah, you always think you're at the bottom until you hit the bottom. Okay. Right? Okay. Uh, fair statement. Uh, I, again, would like to stress, this is not an easy read. If you're reading along with us and you're feeling a little lost at this point, that is natural. That is normal. Yeah. Because this is a very strange text. It, well, it's, it's dense for sure, and it's very stream of consciousness, and stream of consciousness, uh, like, we, like we saw last year with Faulkner, circles. Right, you, you think in circles. Yes, and you don't realize you think in circles because they're your thoughts and you're so close to them. But when we get them on page, it's easy to see that they're circling. But the interesting thing is, we have other things circling too. We have them starting off as sort of middle class, hitting hard times, and then Stephen tries to bring them back. That's a circle, isn't it? True. Sure. Um, we have the influence of friends which is positive and then it goes negative as he's getting bullied and then it goes positive again because he's quick with jokes and then it goes negative again because they're jokes about the wrong things and then it goes positive right okay um we have circling with religion uh, are you catholic are you protestant are you atheist there's also the simplicity of just the uh, circling cycle of poverty because the family's clearly fallen on hard times, so what do they do when they immediately get money? Stephen's like, well, you remember when we had all these nice things. Let's go get all these nice things so we can enjoy them again. Ah, oh, shit, we're out of money again. Right, that's literally what I just said. Was it? Yeah. Okay, and we're back. Um, and, we're, and we're back to where we always are. To be completely honest too. with you, I was trying to think of a point. I'm like, what the fuck was I reading? <laughs> where did that point come from? Uh, and yeah. But we even... Um, so on 68, we get this quote. The cattle, which had seemed so beautiful in the country on sunny days, revolted him, and he could not even look at the milk they yielded. Now that contrasts very heavily with um, what is in this, page 20, but what will be the very first paragraph in the book. Once upon a time, and a very good time it was, there was a moo cow coming along the road, and this moo cow was coming down along the road, met a nicens little boy, Named Baby Taku. So we've got all of these things circling, and we've got all of this instability. We've got all of this uncertainty. Uh, and what happens? Um, what's the famous? Is it Star Wars quote about uh, we hate what we don't understand, or is that X Men? I don't know. People hate what they fear. Maybe X-Men. Yeah. You, 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 when you're not sure, you... Be... Oh, now I can't think of a quote. <laughs> anyway, you, when you're unsure about life in general, you become angry. Okay. And Stephen's becoming an angry young man, isn't he? He is. I, we are starting to see uh, the development of Stephen in a lot of aspects, which is a good thing. That's kind of what I was expecting from this novel. Uh, the first chapter threw me for a bit of a loop, but no, we, we're seeing him develop. We are starting to see him uh, dabble in writing, dabble in theater, very uh, performing, uh, very artistic things. Uh, 
and start to question religion, start to question sin, what it means to be religious, uh, start seeing the world around him for what it is. Starting to see the development of sexuality. The development of sexuality. He's starting to gain a little bit of confidence in himself as well. A uh, quote from 59 of my text, but when he had sung his song and withdrawn into a snug corner of the room, he began to taste the joy of his loneliness. So we see Stephen gaining confidence in himself for the first time, uh, in being comfortable with himself. So that is a great development. Character development in this, so far, spot fucking on. Uh, it, I am enjoying that. Uh, it, it's just a little, difficulty, a little difficult to envelop yourself into this text, because like we've discussed, it's very difficult. It's very dense. It's very select, uh, circular and all over the place. Um, what will be probably on the kissing page to the quote you just read, mm -hmm. or... No, never mind. So it'll be on the next page. Um, we get this passage. They seemed to listen, he on the upper step, she on the lower. She came up to his step many times and went down to hers again. Between their phrases and once or twice stood close to him for some moments on the upper step, forgetting to go down, and then went down. His heart danced upon her movements like a cork upon the tide. He heard what her eyes said to him from beneath their cowl and knew that in some dim past, whether in life or reverie, he had heard their tale before. He saw her urge in her, he saw her urge her vanities, her fine dress and sash and long black stockings, and knew that he had yielded to them a thousand times. Yet a voice within him spoke above the noise of his dancing heart, asking him would he take her gift to which he had only to stretch out his hand. And he remembered the day when he and Eileen had stood looking into hotel grounds, watching the waiters running up a trail of what running up a trail of bunting on the flagstaff and the fox terrier scampering to and fro on the sunny lawn, and how all of a sudden she had broken out into a peal of laughter and had run down the sloping curve of the path. Now, as then, he stood listlessly in his place, seemingly a tranquil watcher of the scene before him. A tranquil watcher of the scene before him. A scene about which he is uncertain. Um, that is an inner turmoil that is reflective of... Um, I'm sorry. So it's reflective of the religious turmoil in the country. It's reflective of, so there's all this drama about the tram, right? The tram is doing what the animals used to do, okay. carrying people around. So there's all of these changes happening. Then there's the inner turmoil of him falling for a woman, having sexual desires, becoming an artist. So all of this change, all of this uncertainty, uh, is being reflected back and forth and back and forth inside the narrative. But we're never given really a place to stay too long, which is part of the ambiguation of the text. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to follow because we jump around. And that fits well in the aspect that uh, things are changing that fast for Stephen at this point in time. So we're getting a, a comparison between both the reader and the narrator where you're feeling just as lost and as confused as him because things are changing this fast, things are happening. Uh, and he's starting to go back and forth between what he knew growing up and what he's understanding now becoming a man. Well, and we even have that part. Um, the difficulty between what he knew growing up and coming into his own is reflected in the troubles of his uncle. Okay. When you think of the family dynamic, aunts and uncles are sort of this weird, if we go back to the word, ambiguation okay. of family, right? Okay. It's your father's brother, your father's sister, your mother's brother, your mother's sister. So they're very, very, very close family. But True. that's not your father and that's not your mother. So oftentimes we have different relationships with uncles and aunts than we do with our parents. Okay. And this is, so it is a more adult relationship that you have with an aunt or an uncle because your aunt or your uncle hasn't been there through your entire rearing, so they're not making assumptions about you in that same way. Okay. His uncle is losing his mind. Yes. So that adult 
one of the first adult relationships you have is oftentimes with one of those familial relations, right? Okay. That is an adult relation. I am an uncle to my niece. I am taking her as her own individual. That is an adult relationship, right? Okay. What does it say when that uncle is losing his mind? At the first adult relationship he has is crumbling. Well, the adult world is. Yeah, your, your adulthood is losing track. Okay. Your adulthood is off the rails. Now, the uncle can be uh, seen as a father figure in this, which would be very typical of any uh, piece of literature. Uncles always play a huge role if they're mentioned in literature because they are always identified as a father figure. Moving back historically, the uncle is more of a father figure than the father themselves. Uh, periods of time where, you know, we, we didn't know, uh, it, moving way back in history, of course, the uncle usually would raise the son because we know that the uncle is family because that is my mother's brother. We don't know the father was actually the father. So uncles actually do play a huge, huge part at, at being in the development of a, a father figure. Now, this period of time, it, you know, definitely we're in that point now where we can understand this is the father, this is the uncle. Uh, but from a literary standpoint, we have to... What? What are you talking about? That's a thing. You didn't know that? No. When is that a thing? Uh, like, moving way, way, way back uh, historically. Like, Don't say way, way, way back historically. Tell me what you're talking about. Moving back historically, uh, like, before... Uh, we're talking, like, early, early history here. Like, uh, pre... I, I'm trying to think of a date. BC like, days? No. I, uh, yeah. 800s-ish. Uh, absolutely so. The uncle would raise the child. That was very often the case because the uncle is identifiable as blood because that is the brother of so, my mother. The father is not always identifiable because, you know, I, I definitely came from my mother, but we have no 100% certainty that I am my father's child. So the uncle has always been a huge part uh, in the child rearing process. This is a thing. Okay, I am 100% certain okay, on this. I will okay. state my reputation okay, on this. Okay, okay. Uh, now, we are living in a very much more developed world at this period of time, obviously. Well, but even in the 800s, that was wherever in the Western world you were living was basically Christendom. True. So you weren't sleeping with more than one man. Well, you were, might have been sleeping with more than one man, but your man didn't know about it. He might have been sleeping with more than I, one woman, but you didn't know about it. There's even a phrase coined for it. It's uh, uh, mama's baby, daddy's maybe. And that's why the uncle always took, uh, usually would take fatherhood of the child to raise them. Well, there's also the phrase, if my grandmother had balls, she'd be my grandfather. But I don't... <laughs> but we can get into that next week. <laughs> we can get into that next week. But no... Let's just go with the point that obviously Stephen here is identifying this well, as a plus father the fact, figure. Now, hold on. Let's take an, another step back from your argument. Whose brother is this? I was agreeing with you on this one, saying that Stephen here is identifying this man as a father figure. Therefore, his first glimpse into adulthood is coming from him. Uh, which would be more poignant than just, you know, this is my uncle, but if he's seeing him as a father figure, I mean, this is where I'm heading. We follow in the footsteps of our fathers. Yeah. Uh, so he is heading towards this route of uncertainty. He's heading into this world of chaos while he's still trying to figure it out before he even gets there. Yeah. Moving on. Damn. Uh, S please, someone back me up on that. Someone's going to have to. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to Google it after the show for you. I'll let you know that's a thing. Um, so we, um, I'm lost. I'm lost. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um... Uh, find something to talk about. So, uh, do you know a lot about Joyce specifically? Because this is the first James Joyce text that I've written. I haven't read a lot about Joyce the man. Do you mean, uh, oh, so you do mean personally? Yes. Joyce pers uh, not too terribly much. I knew he was blind as a bat. Blind as a bat, yeah. We all know that. Is this biographical? Is this young Joyce we're dealing with? I, I don't know. Because I also know Joyce did go to a uh, Jesuit boarding school. Okay. So I, I'm assuming at this point we are getting a lot of biographical information about Joyce. Now, I don't know how this novel is going to develop, uh, but I, I would say James Joyce is qualified to write a book called A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man if it's about James Joyce. So I, I'm interesting. Uh, I think there would be a lot of correlation between Joyce's life growing up and this book here. I, I just didn't know if you had any insight into that. Like I said, I haven't read a lot about Joyce. Well, I'm not sure it necessarily matters all that much if it is strictly autobiographical. Everything is semi-autobiographical when you're looking at... Fair. You, the, only, the only life you can write about is your own. 
Um, but I, I, the interesting part about that to me is that Joyce definitely lived through the modernization of society that was going on. Did. Definitely lived through the religious stuff that was going on. Um, and that is what, one of the interesting things to me about this text, when you're looking at it, uh, even semi-autobiographically, Joyce lived through these things. And it made one hell of a writer. True, very true. Shakespeare lived through a lot of things as well. A lot of that religious strife. Absolutely. Um, made one hell of a writer. And it was, it, was, it was about being secretive, right? It was. It was about being secretive. Uh, Hemingway lived through a lot of, lived through war. You didn't have to be secretive about that. Okay. So what is Hemingway's prose like? It's very blunt. Very on the nose. It, what is this prose like? Oh, it's buried in there, isn't it? It is. What is Shakespeare like? Oh, it's buried in there, isn't it? So, since we're just talking about uh, Joyce as the writer and Joyce as the man, and this being possibly uh, biographical in some sense, uh, we do go uh, with Stephen here coming into a sexual awakening. That's where we're left at this, is he's with a prostitute. Um, do you know much about Joyce's personal life? Uh, he was a sexual deviant. Oh, yes. Did he... I, I, I'm just going to leave this because it is easily found out here. There is a letter that James Joyce wrote. I cannot remember if it was to his mistress or his wife or his girlfriend, whatever. But if you Google James Joyce's letter to mistress, oh my God. To read this text, this prose here from a man, and then compare it to that letter, oh my God. Yeah. Joyce has some, uh, some issues. And I'm wondering if we're looking at this at a biographical standpoint, if we're going to be exploring that a lot more. Especially if we're uh, ending this chapter here, uh, Stephen, with a prostitute. So we're obviously going to be talking about the uh, sexual awakening of the young man. Uh, I, I'm assuming that's going to play a bigger role in this here. I'm curious to see how this plays out. I think I'm going to have to do my Joyce research because I, I think this might be young Joyce. I yeah. think this might be spot on young Joyce. Anyway. Uh, well, along those, along those lines, um, on, on what is 81 in my text... This fellow, uh, we're, we're sitting in class, and the teacher has graded the papers, and we get this. This fellow has heresy in his essay. A hush fell on the class. Mr. Tate did not break it, but dug, but dug with his hand between his crossed thighs while his heavily starched linen creaked around his neck and wrists. Stephen did not look up. It was a raw spring morning, and his eyes were still smarting and weak. He was conscious of failure and of detection, of squalor of his own mind and home, and felt against his neck the raw edge of his turned and jagged collar. A short, loud laugh from Mr. Tate set the class more at ease. Perhaps you didn't know that, he said. Where? asked Stephen. Mr. Tate withdrew his delving hand and spread out the essay. Here. It is about the creator and the soul. Er, mer, 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 ah! Without a possibility of ever approaching nearer. That's heresy, Stephen murmured. I meant without a possibility of ever reaching. It was, it was a submission that Mr. Tate appeased, folded up the essay, and passed it across to him, saying, Oh, ah, ever reaching, that's another story. But the class was not so soon appeased. Though nobody spoke to him of the affair af after class, he could feel it about him. He could feel about him a vague, general, malignant joy. Have we stopped believing in God? God is going to play a huge part in this novel. The idea of sin, the idea of corruption, the idea of the church will be a huge part of this novel. I don't know at this point we have stopped believing in God, but I believe it is very safe to say we are getting there. We are definitely moving away from God. I think it is certainly safe to say that we enjoy playing with the idea of tempting God in the very least. Okay. And, and damn it, Joyce, like we mentioned before, the man buries things throughout here. Uh, when he's writing his first poem, and he's sitting down, uh, from force of habit, he had written at the top of the first page the initial letters of the Jesuit motto, A-M-D-G, uh, which stands for Ad Majorum De Glorium, for the glor greater glory of God. It is so ingrained into him that even when he's sitting down to write poetry, to start beginning as an artist, to start looking at things from a different light, he still has that religious rigor built into him. However, moving forward, when we're talking about the rector, 
he did nothing about the whole glasses situation. Uh, he thought that would be the outlet, that that would take care of this. He told the rector. Basically, they had a good laugh about it and moved on. So you beat the kid senseless and you did nothing about it. There are little pieces here being built to show that Stephen is going to turn on this church, to turn away from God and to seek his own path. I, again, don't think we've made it there yet, but I think you are correct. He's starting to play with that idea. He's starting to tempt the fates. He's also been pulled out of religious school by a religious father. Yes. Right? And there's constantly the argument about the religion in the household. Who's right? What's going on in this society that we're in right now? So religion is not seen as the safe place. And if we're right, how come we're being punished by our fortunes changing so boldly? True. I mean, that's, you know, the the go-to. You know, God has a plan for all of us. He works in mysterious ways, which is fine to say when things are going well. But when it's going to shit and you have a drinking problem and you have no money to feed your kids and you have to pull them out of school. And your hoopty just broke down. And your hoopty just broke down. You got a problem. It's not a mysterious way anymore. Yeah. So there's all of this. So like we said, all of this confusion with religion. Yes. All of this confusion brought up about uh, a sexual awakening. All of this confusion brought about now um, with the modernization of society. All this confusion brought about by art. And he's constantly referencing art. He's constantly participating in art. He's constantly True. creating art. All of this confusion brought around now by moving houses. When, when, okay, so if I take this, are you nearsighted or farsighted? I don't know. Doesn't matter. If I put this book right here, how are you gonna, what are you gonna do to, to read the page? I have to get back. You gotta take a step back, don't you? Okay. We talked about that in the first episode, didn't we? We did. Stephen has this strange habit of starting someplace small, Stephen Daedalus, then listing the school, then listing this, Moving then back. listing this, 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 all the way back to the universe, right? I am Stephen Daedalus. I am walking beside my father whose name is Simon Daedalus. We are in Cork in Ireland. Cork is a city. Our room is in the Victoria Hotel. Victoria and Stephen and Simon. Simon and Stephen and Victoria names we get that passage here okay please carry on we're back to zooming out and why do we zoom out we zoom out to get a whole picture we zoom out to refocus we zoom out to see where the hell we are and here we've got him returning to zooming out we went the entirety so on this is on page 92 of my text the chapter ends on page 99 through the entirety of this second chapter, which is about 30 pages in this text, 26 of them, we had no zooming out. We had straightforward motion, baby, yeah. We had conflict. We had conflict with former friends. We lost friends. We had sexual flirtation. We had family, um, we had family discombobulation. We had a moving of homes. We never took the time to zoom out, and here we are doing it. We're okay. doing it again. We're circling back to zooming out. Just a, a strange thought here, which would have been time appropriate. This idea of moving backwards to find the answer would have been, about the time of this publishing, a big, big, big deal in the field of linguistics. James Joyce would have absolutely known about it. Because this is when we first started to come up with the idea of historical linguistics, that in order to derive an answer, you had to move backwards. So the only way to find that answer, that Stephen Daedalus on the inside, is you had to see what surrounded Stephen Daedalus and what surrounded that. And therefore, you could find the answer to it. So from a standpoint, like a linguistic standpoint, and maybe I'm just rambling at this point because that's what I've been hammering in my head for the last six months, this would fit 100%. If you want to find the answer, you have to see what's around you and you have to see where you come from. So you have to analyze what's around you, not just you. Well, what is, Steve, what is, what is James Joyce dealing with? What is James Joyce dealing with? He, he's dealing arms, and his arms are language. Okay. Right? He's dealing in the arms of words. Fair statement. So he's moving back to see where he came from. Very well. Anything else you want to touch on this week, Portrait of the Artist? There were some interesting words in, in, in this, uh, nothing but in this chapter. Words in this chapter. Deucedly, meaning doubly, meaning twice over. Okay. Mannings which is uh, a small man, I guess. And uh, Jack Heen, meaning an arrogant lower-class person. 
so we I don't know if we mentioned this last week or not, but both of our does yours have the annotations at the bottom? Some, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, both of our editions have annotations, and literally every single page you open to yeah. has at least one annotation to let you know what the hell James Joyce is talking about. Uh, so if you're picking this up, if you're reading along with us, may we suggest making sure you have the annotations yeah. in your text? Uh, so because were Jackines the proto hipsters? You're talking about an arrogant lower class person. How many rich hipsters do you know? Well, none of whom would identify with being rich. Right. None of whom would identify with being rich. But, you know, this beer, this beer is not quite as nutty as I had hoped. Let me tell you, I'll tell you right now that hipsters have money because you used to be able to go and get a PBR for like $1.50 out of a can. That is now a craft beer and it costs you $6 a can at a bar. It's not a craft beer. That is what they bill it as that's and how that's how what they, they charge it as. Yeah. Bastards. Yeah. Anyway, that's all I've got for Fort of the Artist this week. I, I am... This is a dense text. This is a difficult text. I feel like there's worth in this. Uh, I've got one more small point, um, but I could ramble for ages on this. Um, so they have, his classmates have cornered him, and he says that he thinks Byron is the best poet. In any case, Byron was a heretic immoral too. I don't care what he was, cried Stephen hotly. You don't care whether he was a heretic or not, said Nash. What do you know about it, shouted Stephen. You never read a line of anything except a, a trans or, or Boland either. I know Byron was a bad man, said Boland. We're going through this again in society. Okay. Uh, these purity trials by, you cannot, you're not allowed to differentiate a person's ideas from who they are and what they do. Okay. We're going through that again, aren't we? And it's interesting because we think this is a new thing. This is something that's just propped up. But apparently, it's been around for 100 this, years. Yeah, this goes back forever. Interesting. Um, yeah. Very interesting. Uh, Adrian, do you want to end us this week? So this was part two of a six-part series as we journey through a portrait of the artist as a young man by James Joyce. Uh, we would appreciate it if you hit the like button because it really helps us out on the channel. Uh, subscribe if you have not, but you were looking forward to more uh, novel discussions, read-throughs, etc. And if you are inclined to help us make more content here on Strip Coverlet, there is a link to our Patreon, as always, to be found in the description below.